Hey. Uh, I am here today with Mike Neuter, who is most well known for drawing charts for the Ethereum Foundation, and Max Resnick, who is the only boy to have censored the Ethereum blockchain for 12 full seconds. Uh, welcome, guys. Thanks for coming on. Do you want to give real intros? Mike, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, that was that was pretty much accurate. Um, work at the EF, have been there for about a year, mostly working on um, MEV stuff and and staking. And yeah, happy to to get into some of the nitty gritty. Yeah, we actually just you know we did some test blocks, so it wasn't just twelve seconds. It was like twelve seconds, like three times. So that's thirty six seconds if you're counting. But uh, well, that's what you're known for, at least, is, is having sense of the theory. <laughs> We're known for the one block, but there's two other test blocks that we also did. So really, it's it's much more powerful. Um, yeah, I think that's a, a pretty good intro of what we do. But uh, I work at Special Mechanisms Group, which is um, now the MEV Research Division within Consensus. And uh, I work on the research side of things, mostly working on PBS research, censorship resistance, keeping the EF on their toes, you know. <laughs> Awesome. Cool. Okay, guys. Well, um, I thought we'd start maybe we could start with you, Mike, and then obviously, Max, I'd like to hear your opinion on this question as well. Um, so how far are we out now from the merge? The merge occurred in, what, a year and three months ago or something? Yeah, September 2022. Nice. Yeah. Do you have that tattooed on your arm? <laughs> no, I wasn't in the space then, so. Were you not? Well, I was following, but I wasn't like full time. Okay. Uh, okay. So anyways, we are, uh, yeah, uh, over a year out from the merge and I'd just like to hear what you guys think as to how Ethereum's doing. Um, like m maybe, it, maybe a very easy way to start and obviously dig into this, but like if you had to grade Ethereum on a scale of one to 10 since the merge with one being n not doing optimally, um, and 10 being doing very well. And also, with regards to some of the reservations or criticisms or concerns that people had going into the merge. Um, and yeah, you can like define those or talk about those however you want. But uh, yeah, like how do you think Ethereum's doing, Mike? Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, I think if, if we want to talk about overall performance, like it would make sense to break it down into like a few different categories, right? So in terms of like the execution of, of kind of getting proof of stake working, getting withdrawals done, some of the kind of like core features of, of the consensus layer that needed to be shipped. I think like doing a super great job, um, you know, Chappella happened um, without a without any issues in April of last year. Um, that was the, the withdrawals fork. And then, you know, since then, the the big focus and the big push has been 4844, which is the, the sharding roadmap. This kind of like improves the amount of data that um, Ethereum produces and, and supplies to L2s. This is all like kind of in the vein of the, the roll-up centric roadmap. So yeah, I think in terms of the vision there, like everything makes a lot of sense and it's kind of like a very cohesive story moving forward. I think in terms of the research, there's a lot um, that has been happening kind of outside the protocol that is pressing on it in a bunch of different directions. And I think that's something we're kind of coming to terms with right now. So a, a couple examples of this is like classic the classic one is MEV, right? Like this is the merge um, was happening right around when people were starting to like pay a lot more attention to MEV. Um, and as a result, the merge was shipped with Mev Boost. This is like the sidecar software that allows proposers to interact with block builders. And, you know, we're seeing kind of the, some of the negative externalities of that. There's like um, dependencies on, on these relays. There's this whole builder centralization, builder censorship, so I think MEV is like a big vector that um, is kind of outside of the the view of the protocol and and has been shaping the direction of of research and hasn't really impacted the we haven't gotten to a point where we're like ready to put something in the protocol that to deal with it. Um, also, I think um, like LST and like stake centralization has been like a big theme. Um, I think it's also another one of these things where there is like centralization pressure and that really like freaks people out and. Um, I think that that concern is warranted, um, but we're also like trying to figure out what what exactly the right path forward is there. And then I guess kind of in the current meta, I, I view restaking as like the next big 
not necessarily like existential threat, but it's like a huge part of the narrative for this cycle. And also just like a, a, something that's very close to the metal as far as like what impacts the Ethereum protocol, you know, like it, it distorts the incentives around participating in Ethereum consensus. And then it, it presents another vector by which like centralization could be kind of like forced onto the protocol faster than the, um, you know, faster than the protocol is able to react. So I think there's, there's a lot going on, obviously, like, and I think in terms of figuring out what comes next in this, in this hard fork, Electra is the one after Deneb, that's like probably being targeted for the end of, of this year. And I think a little more clarity and vision around like what, what we're prioritizing and what we're building for in that time frame would be important. So I think like looking, looking back, we've done like a really great job. I'm not going to make, not maybe a 10, but like whatever, like an eight or a nine. Looking forward, I think like in this current moment, we could use a little more um, clarity maybe um, and a little more um, focus for for moving forward. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Max? Yeah, I think, well, one thing I would just want to emphasize is like how crazy it was that the merge went off without a hitch. I think that was like, I think we had some issues in like lending markets with, around the merge that I didn't think were great, but I think it was like pretty incredible that it just went off and like we, because it was so f- smooth, like nobody even talks about like what could have happened. So that was, that was great. I think collectively the the community kind of took a step back after the merge and was like, yay, we did it, celebrated. And then um, like Mike was saying, these, these MEV things really crept up on us. One thing I will say that I, I just want to say, I think we got wrong or it wasn't me because I wasn't wasn't really that deep in the weeds at the time. But um, so it's not my fault. Just just to be clear, but uh, the the stake threshold and not putting delegated proof of stake in the protocol, I think we we pretty clearly got wrong, and that's kind of not necessarily causing the stake centralization issues that we're seeing today, but uh, is causing some bottlenecks in the speed of the blockchain i would say so wait the, the threshold being the 32 ETH, the 32 ETH threshold for how much you need well i think you could have it higher so that you need more eth or or you could have delegated proof of stake so that you don't need to have five hundred thousand nodes many of which are just running on the same box um so you have like you know 50 nodes running on the same box, all making a signal. Sorry, just just to clarify, validators would be running on the same node. Like usually, that's that's just the the terminology there. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, just just <laughs> don't want people to get confused. So sorry. yeah, you have 50 validators, each with their own fifty thousand dollars of ETH staked, all running on the same box, each generating a signature that needs to be verified at the end of the epoch. and that causes some some overhead for the network. So I think that was like something we clearly was a mistake. Um, the MEV stuff crept up on us and that, there's no way to know that that would be as crazy as, as it has been in terms of the acceleration. But it does call into question like the timelines of these things. And I think we're starting to get a little bit rushed in what we're doing because MEV moves so quickly and we moved from like the inception of PBS to 95% blocks produced by PBS to everybody but one of the major builders censoring and the relays also come under that pressure really, really quickly. And so I think we need to be careful because we have these huge lead times before um, things get in. So we're talking about stuff to go into the Electra hard fork now. And we feel like we need to do something about the censorship now because, you know, it's going to come in in a year and who knows where we'll be at that time. And that means, I think we're we're getting a little bit rushed in terms of what we're doing. So, okay, can I can let me just let me just play devil's advocate here for a second. All right, like Max, let you say that MEV crap up on us. I mean, there. I think, I think you're right. You were also the one writing about integrated searcher builders. Like, how long ago was this now? Six months, tw- twelve months, like. But any, anyhow, my, my point in saying this is that, like, there were certainly people, and, and in fact, there were people saying, should we delay the merge until we have some enshrined PBS mechanism, right? Like, and I, I don't know, you guys can explain this better than I can, but, like, 
the essence of it is right now there's these these, these relays, right? These trusted relays, and I don't want to go too like rehashing this, but they take blocks from builders and then they ultimately pass them on to the validators. The reason for this is because neither can really trust each other to give them the right amount and they don't want to dupe each other. Okay, so there were a lot of people talking about this prior to the merge. So, I mean, I I do wonder like some of these things, and I also have another question regarding stake centralization for Mike after this in the same vein in terms of like, we say this crap up on us, but like sometimes I'm like, eh, I don't know. Like a lot of people were actually saying exactly this. So, I mean, what was your inclination like? I don't know. Maybe three, six months prior to the merge. I know you were maybe working on other stuff at the time, but like, did did you not foresee this? I mean, I'm not saying I foresaw it, but I I did see other people foreseeing this. For example, I think I mean, there's only so much you can foresee. Like, you're I was not working in MEV, so I wasn't like super into the weeds until like about February of 2023. So like, I wasn't actually like super knowledgeable about the topic three to six months before the merge uh in fact that's like about when i got into crypto anyway so like i really just was not knowledgeable about a whole lot of stuff but at the time if you put me in a position if you put me right now you know and said you're working on mbb three months before i probably would have foreseen some of the stuff but i don't think i would have had a perfect view of you know how the end game would end up right i think the data it, it's actually you know, I'm happy that we did it because we got to see the data instead of just like speculating about what would happen and a bunch of theories and, and just analysis paralysis not doing anything. Um, now we see the data. The issue I see is we're not acting quick quickly enough. We're not iterating quickly enough such that we can see the problems that we see in the data and solve them. Like th that's where I see the issue now. And I'm, I'm glad we have the data so we can see what actually happened and not just like pontificate about it. Yeah, I just to respond to that, I do think I, I also was not like in the space. So also like during the merge, so kind of speaking off the hip here, but I think there, there was a very small subset of people that was saying we should do EPBS before the merge. I think Steph in particular at Flashbots was like the one who, who was like advocating for this. But I think also the historical context of like the merge was already like such a huge lift and it like there was just this this bias for action for getting it done like max was saying like if if you never end up shipping it because like you're delaying for epbs like that that just seemed like a non-starter at that point in the process so i i guess i i can't say that that was a bad decision um in terms of the the delegated proof of stake thing and like this is kind of a continuation of that same point I think at the time they were looking or they were looking around at other chains. And when you look at the delegation, it's like almost everyone always delegates to like a very small minority of like the best, you know, uh, validators. So for example, there's just like on Cosmos chains, like the, it's like a very power law distribution thing where the top like three or four validators get like 95% of the stake. And the reason for this is kind of like, very intuitive and almost like a psychological thing. Like if I'm going to delegate my money to someone like through the protocol, like, of course, I'm going to choose like the best validator. Like I, I'm not going to be altruistic and risk like my ETH getting slashed by delegating to some like long tail validator because I like care about the the distribution of ETH among among them. You know what I mean? And also, I think, yeah, it it just at the time didn't feel like an like a decision that that the core protocol should make. I think less like the staking centralization feels, or I guess like the LST market cap growing so large feels less of an issue about delegation not existing and more an issue about um, withdrawals not being enabled for like a year. So like a, a huge piece of the puzzle here is that um, the beacon chain launched in like 2020, right? I think it was like a couple years before the merge actually happened. And so in order to get liquidity um, on that staked ETH, like, there was no withdrawals. So you, you had to use this LST, like this derivative version of ETH, which was Steeth. That was the one that like cropped up and kind of gained all the market share. Um, because otherwise you just locked your ETH in this contract and you weren't able to touch it for some unforeseen amount of time, you know? And this was when the merge was continually being delayed. And so like, it was, it was super high risk to stake natively. And so getting like a liquid version of it just made a lot of sense. So I think those are the two pieces that have... Have like contributed to as far as the the delegated proof of stake story goes. Yeah, like, like 
do you think that that is like what happened anyway is like people just gravitated towards the i mean i think what we saw is we looked at the equilibrium in delegated proof of stake chains which first of all they're like more there's just less actors there that are competent so like it's not a great comparison and we said oh we don't want that to happen so we're just not going to do anything about it and we didn't do anything about it and it happened anyway yeah wait mike let me just let me just like further this point for one second uh did you like just level with me here <laughs> did you think that more people were going to run validators on raspberry Pis? Like, cause I, I guess the reason I'm, I'm I'm trying to be reductive here is because there was this big. It, it seems to have died down, right? Because I think people have I don't know moved on to other things. But like, there was this obvious big concern about Lido crossing this threshold of what thirty three percent, and the I, I I don't really have a strong opinion on this for what it's worth. Not that not that my opinion matters, anyways. But I don't have a strong opinion. But what I will say is that there was like very strong. Uh, well, forces like like what you were saying first of all the the like year long lockup or or unforeseen lockup of your stake but like Georgios and Hasu right like two two people who are pretty in the weeds on these on this protocol wrote this you know very long piece saying like there's a very strong possibility that the stake ultimately aggregates into a single liquid staking protocol and so I think what some people have wondered is like this basically came into fruition and then people are you know sort of up in i don't know up in ours i know this is the right word but like you see some posts about like we got to keep we got to keep the stake out of lido's hands and, and and i think a lot of people at least myself are sitting here we're like dude everybody said this was gonna happen like it's it was like this was almost like a guarantee and so that's why like when i do see some maybe like ethereum foundation researchers you know talking about lido i'm like do they think that everybody was gonna run a validator on a raspberry pi like is that is it was that what we thought well okay I, I think there's two things here right like doing in protocol delegation um kind of lends itself to the situation where it's it's almost much easier to stake right so you're lowering the barrier of entry so that like almost everyone can stake and i think the way cosmos deals with this is like they set a cap on the amount of the supply that can be staked right it's like only like but, but if you look at these chains, like the in terms of percentage of supply that's actually staked, it's like way higher than Ethereum, right? Ethereum's at like 24% right now or something. And a lot of these other chains might be at like 60, 70, 80%. Um, and so that's kind of like, that's the first number to consider is like, um, if, if you don't make that easy, then instead of staking and delegating my stake, I might just like hold on to that ETH and, and use it in DeFi and like kind of keep the circulation, keep some of the money in this properties of ETH or the asset instead of like doing this trustless thing through the protocol and, and going that way. Um, in terms of like the second number, so that's kind of the first number, which is total amount of the supply that's staked. The second number is like kind of the distribution of the stake among different validators, right? Um, that question I think is... Yeah, it's it does feel like everyone um, kind of saw that coming, but I'm not sure I necessarily buy that it's it's like gonna be super monopolistic. Like right now, it it's like a large percentage of the liquid staking market is is owned by Lido, but like there are people vampiring them. There's like people are vying for that thing, and I think stable coins show us that like there doesn't necessarily have to be like a single monopoly version of like a token. Like it could be like a few, you know, big, big competing liquid staking tokens or, or liquid restaking tokens when that happens that are like all, you know, giving different access and different risk profiles and stuff like that. So yeah, I guess I, I, I that that's kind of what I have to say to it. I think people, there was a lot of uncertainty and um, yeah, I, I can't like criticize many of the decisions they made because it just, it feels like they made the best with what they had at the time, you know, information wise. Yeah, I think I think it's fine to say like they acted like with with limited information, but it's also like okay to say that that was the wrong decision. Like now looking back, right? But I don't think at the time we knew exactly what would happen, but certainly I would have guessed that we would see similar levels of centralization as we do now. I also think 
like comparing to Cosmos chains is very hard because like there's nothing to do with that Cosmos chain token other than stake. <laughs> and that, that calculus of like how many tokens are staked, actually the main input to that is what is the other thing you can do with the token, not what is the other thing you can do with a dollar. But you know, you, you have to make the decision of do I stake my ETH or do I not stake my ETH? If I sell my ETH because I see attractive yields somewhere else, then I've just given ETH to somebody else who has to make that decision. So the, the only factor that matters is the difference between the reward ratio, which I think some of the Cosmos chains set way too high relative to what the outside option is and, and what the outside option is, which is like, you know, using DeFi or using it to transact or something else. Cool. Okay. Well, okay. Let's go back to MAV now. Sorry, I didn't mean to derail us from the interesting stuff. Uh, okay. You guys are going to have to take over on this part. Uh, Mike, I want you to tell us what the Ethereum community's idea for EIP-1559 was originally. Okay. And then, Max, I want you to respond with what has actually happened and why you have bravely, I should note, gone on a crusade against EIP-1559. Yeah, sure. I, I guess this isn't so much MEV and more just like transaction mechanics on chain and stuff, but <laughs> it it all fits together, yeah. Max is going to um, bring MEV back into it. <laughs> yeah, so um, 1559 is as originally concepted, uh, like I think, and I'm I'm not the leading expert here, but so I'll kind of I'll preface everything I say with that. Um, if if you really want the details, like you should read Tim Roughgarden's paper and talk to Barnaby. Like those are the those are the canon sources. Um, but the the way I understand it, it's it's a mechanism for resource control, right? We're trying to price the the amount that that you have to pay to get included in a block, right? And the way you know, I guess. Comparing to before the before fifteen fifty nine was implemented, there was this like first price PGA situation where people were competing to get on chain by like um, what's called a priority gas auction. So they're like raising the the priority fee that they're willing to pay, and it, it results in like pretty bad execution during <clears throat> especially like high MEV periods, right? Because um, you might be trying to just send a swap. Um, through Uniswap, but you get immediately priced out by all these people because there's price action on the centralized exchange, and and there all these searchers are like willing to pay like way more than you to to get into a block. So 1559, as originally concepted, was like kind of this this oracle mechanism that says this is the clearing price for getting into a block. Like this is this is how much you have to pay, um, and obviously it has this like adjustable mechanism where if the block is overfilled. Um, like if it's above the 15 million target, then the price of entry goes up and up and up. And so it kind of is almost like the second price auction where the the amount you pay isn't necessarily like, um, yeah, the, the amount you pay is basically the price that the people in the block before you were, were paying plus some amount or minus some amount based on how many of those people paid that price. So yeah, I think that's, that's kind of the TLDR of of what it was incepted to do. And it was supposed to make it a lot easier for, for wallets and for people transacting with the blockchain to know how much they needed to pay, right? They they have this base fee that they know if they pay, they'll get on-chain in like the vast majority of cases in the next slot, which I think made the UX like way smoother and and um, way way more predictable for, for everyone. And that, that part, just to like, to be clear, that, that part is pretty much objectively okay. true now, right? Like, <laughs> it, it, at least at least that that last part right in terms of like almost guaranteed inclusion that yep. part we have okay cool so i just yeah. wanted to clarify and al that. okay also al also the last thing i wanted to say sorry that i meant to bring up but i kind of forgot is it it allows some of this fee revenue to go to the protocol rather than to the proposers and kind of like to the protocol just is through this ultrasound money thing where you burn that oh yeah you got it and... sorry yes the burn part you have to don't don't forget about the burn part because max is about to talk in a second <laughs> right yeah so um previously like all of that fee revenue was just going to the proposer so you could get like extremely lucky if you were the proposer during a given slot because people were like willing to pay like crazy amounts i mean that still exists today but if if the base fee um 
you know, captures some of that of that revenue and directs it to all ETH holders rather than the those that are just participating in the consensus, then like that distribution mechanism is um, possible with 1559. Yeah, let me. All right. I'm going to start with the burn because uh, I think there's like a big misconception that this allows you to distribute revenue when basically you're taking revenue away from the validators, which means you actually, for the same level of security, have to give them more revenue by inflating the token. So you're burning, but you also, if you want the same level of security from a theory perspective, you have to give them more rewards. And the way you do that is by inflating the token. So it's a great meme, but if you think about it from an actual economic perspective, it doesn't make sense. Unless actually Justin Drake has made this point, which I think is a valid thing to consider. If there are tax differences in the way that we treat the burn versus the inflation, then that might change what decision the protocol should do because we don't want to be paying more in taxes to the U.S. government, say, as a in that like for example, if one is treated as capital gains and one is treated as income, then uh, the the one that's treated as income is going to be taxed more heavily. But from an economic perspective, ignoring that taxes, I think they're the same, and so I don't think the burn does anything uh, other than distort the incentives for the validators to include the right transactions. Now, the other thing I, I want to say, like, from my perspective, talking to people, the thing that was the biggest issue for users was this idea of users doing something and then regretting their decision later. So user regret was too high. Basically, users were either paying more than the threshold for inclusion was on the block in the first price or, or PGA auction, or they were playing the equilibrium, which is like to shade how much they're willing to pay in their the PGA. The clearing price was like slightly higher than that, but below their true value of getting on chain and they weren't getting on chain. So both of those are regret inducing. One is I'm paying too much. When I look at the chain, it looks like I'm paying too much. And the other one is I'm like paying too little to get in. But if I just bumped my bid up a little bit, I would have gotten in and I would have been happy. So like post hoc, they're looking at the situation and saying, oh, I regret my decision. But a priori, before the outcome was realized, they're making the optimal decision. And that's not a great experience for users. So I think EIP 1559 in some ways succeeded in addressing that for users who only want to be included in the next block. But most users don't want that. So like it lets you get in the next block, but like if you're actually looking at, hey, I want to be included in the next three blocks or the next five blocks, which is actually what most users I would say want, other than like the very specific MEV searchers or the people who are like really like professional traders trying to trade. Um, they now are in a situation which is in some ways even more strategic than what the first price auction was, where they have to like guess which way the base fee is trending and set their parameters according to that. And I, I think that's not a great outcome. So I think it's worked in some ways in terms of targeting that UX, but only for that static model of user who wants to get into the next block. And that's also happens to be the model that was analyzed in Tim Ruffgarn's original paper, which says it's it's great, but if you expand the model out to users who who don't necessarily need to be included in the next block, it doesn't work so well. Can I let me just ask a quick question before I forget? Uh, and maybe this is better for Mike, but both of you guys can respond. Do you think that Ethereum should be designing for tax purposes? Like in all seriousness, I mean I, that, that's like a logical uh, argument, I guess. That that seems valid, but at the same time, like. Is I mean, how do you, how do you think about that, Mike? Like, is this something that should be considered like as a protocol design constraint? Um, I think it's a fair question. In general, my hunch would be no, um, because you know we're trying to build something that's like anti fragile, like World War Three grade. Like, <laughs> we shouldn't consider like the current jurisdictional constraints as like set in stone it by any means, and and also like. Obviously, tax codes across the world have like very different implications for different people. And like, if you are very like U.S. centric or like, uh, you know, global 
global west centric, then you might be like designing something that doesn't work for for people in other parts of the world. So, yeah, I mean, I I don't love when tax stuff gets evoked as like a, a justification for doing something in the protocol. I guess it doesn't feel doesn't feel correct. Yeah, I think all other things being equal, if, if we had two mechanisms that were exactly the same in their behavior, but one of them was slightly more favorable for tax purposes, we should we should do the tax purpose thing. But I don't think we should sacrifice the alignment of incentives in the in the ecosystem in order to achieve tax purposes or a meme. Like, yeah, Max, you've like I don't know how vocal you've been about this publicly, but I mean, you seem to think that. All right. What I have inferred, at least, maybe I'm reading between the lines, is that you seem to think that 1559 was largely to construct a meme of ultrasound money. Like, I think functionally you believe that, right? Like, the ability to burn, like, you are, you are taking coins out of the supply. Like, this is good because now there are less coins. Like, this is, I have intuited this from a lot of what you said. And also, on that note as well, you have more, I think, directly said that you think that this has overall reduced censorship resistance as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think to, I don't want to like put words in anybody's mouth in terms of what they, I, I wasn't around at the time. I don't know what they were thinking. I think there's a lot of people who were closely involved in this, or at least in shilling it, who wanted the burn for the meme. And I think also like, it's, it's just a symptom of like a lot of people who are working on this are like very, very heavily invested in ETH as an asset. And so they have like 90% of their net worth in ETH and they have huge amounts like of exposure to this asset. And that distorts their incentives away from making the best chain and towards, you know, pumping the ETH price in the short term. And so, um, you know, people were just jealous of, of Bitcoin with the finite money. They're like, we can do better. We can get this burn going um and it worked at the time i think it, it worked pretty well and it still works you still see people posting about how much is getting burned um at the end of the day though i don't think it was it's a good it's another one of those things that we shouldn't consider in in the protocol which is like how memeable something is um okay mike do you have anything like you want to respond to that yeah i well i guess okay I do sympathize with this whole, like, yeah, people who have bags want the price of ETH to go up. Like, obviously, they're going to pump this meme because it it's good for the bag. <laughs> um, like, I understand that that's what it looks like. I also do genuinely believe that, like, the long-term security of Ethereum does depend on, like, Ethereum being valuable, right? Like, there's this whole idea that, like, in order to secure the network, you have you have to like incentivize people to to stake and to behave honestly as stakers and if if the network secures like you know a, tr a trillion dollars of tvl or whatever and the economic security quote unquote is very low because the amount people have staked is like of a token that's not worth very much if ether was not ver worth very much then like you have that mismatch and and that issue does kind of come out in terms of weakening the security guarantees of the protocol um so yeah, I, I think the meme is powerful in that and and it also like it does make the long term issuance and like security budget kind of type thing for Ethereum make a lot of sense, right? Like I definitely Bitcoin has like the strongest like long term meme of like twenty one million bitcoins, like we're never gonna exceed that threshold. Um, whereas like Ethereum could be like long term inflationary, like there's no there's no hard supply cap in the same way. But like in the same vein, it doesn't feel like Bitcoin has a very clear long term security budget like model, you know, like it depends on either the price of Bitcoin doubling every halvening and like that, that then you have like the same amount of security based on the amount like you're paying the miners. Or it depends on there being like enough usage on the base chain that like the fees make up for the amount of of each issuance happening period. So like, you know, that is conditioned on something on one of those two outcomes, whereas like Ethereum's budget is always going to be like um, kind of not conditioned on on something else. It's like it's very well defined in in the 
the burn and yeah, the I mean, supply. okay, yeah. I, I, I've, I've personally, we don't have to like completely derail this, but I personally had like some reservations with this rationale. I mean, like functionally, both, both networks need people to demand block space. Like, and, and this, in, in, and, and when you hear that Ethereum has <laughs> solved the security budget problem, it's like it, there, there's nothing <laughs> that, like, like truly, there's nothing in economics that says that tail inflation guarantees long-term viability like people still need to pay a sufficient amount to use the block space and, and and the validators still need to feel that they are compensated to do so so i mean okay we don't have to go down a proof of work versus proof of stake debate or, or rather uh bitcoin versus ethereum security models debate but i do think this has been well uh well designed shilling that was a word max used i won't use that but a well-designed narrative if you will it's not like there's any there's it's there's no solution i mean there the uh, same similar minor death spiral can occur if ethereum's price is not sufficient i mean it's it, it we're not talking about like you know discovering uh re reinventing the wheel here so um okay uh max quickly now that i've gotten my piece out and i feel i feel good about it um can you talk to us a little bit about, like, more specifically what you think? Well, we can talk about 1559 and the censorship stuff, but but maybe just, I don't know, censor, we can start moving into, like, censorship as a whole. Uh, what, do you, what are you seeing right now? Yeah, I think, like, it's, it's an, another aspect of this is because you're burning most of the fees, you've changed the incentives for the person who is deciding on whether to include things or not. Before all the incentives were aligned properly with a first price auction has, you know, maybe not as good for users from a, from a UX perspective, but it does have two very nice properties. One of them is efficiency, which is, you know, the people who want the block space most in equilibrium will get in um, if they're playing properly, basically. Uh, the second thing is it's incentive aligned for the proposer who's actually making the decisions about whether to execute this protocol to execute this protocol. Uh, in contrast, when you burn a bunch of the fees, when you burn 90% of the fee, my reward as a proposer for including you is 90% lower. And so if somebody pays me a bribe not to include you, the size of that bribe in relation to how big your tip is, is much smaller, right? So I think like that's has changed the game and it also has changed a bunch of other things that involve inclusion and missing slots and all kinds of stuff where just like the fact that eip 1559 exists and is diverting revenue away from the direct action and the direct person who's taking that action has made a bunch of other incentives like the the incentive to not miss slots be out of whack with what they should be in an ideal world Mike, what are you working on right now to solve this? <laughs> yeah, so I guess censorship resistance like does feel super critical. And I think Max and I like both view it as kind of one of the core primitives that Ethereum has. And like if you give up on censorship resistance, then you kind of like give up on a lot of what makes Ethereum like unique and differentiated in the space. So um yeah, I guess I, I definitely buy Max's argument that the cost of censorship um, is changed. And like this, this actually Vitalik wrote about like a long time ago. He he like drew the the total price of the transaction and was like, you know, the, the censorship is just the tip now instead of the base fee plus the tip, like all of that stuff. Um, in terms of what we can do from a protocol perspective, I think the the latest push that I've been kind of like crusading for is this inclusion list thing. Um, and inclusion lists are cool because it's it's like super simple to describe and it it kind of gives some stronger censorship resistance properties back to the protocol um, in especially in this world where where we have like proposers separated from builders and builders are building like 95% of the blocks. So I guess the, the quick summary of inclusion list is a proposer who wants to outsource their block can also include with that request to outsource the block a set of transactions those transactions will either get included in their block or the subsequent block and the protocol will enforce like the validity of of those blocks as 
like only insofar as they actually include the transactions that were in the inclusion list. Um, so yeah, this is kind of like a very simple way that we can get kind of give age, give some amount of agency back to proposers and allow them to set some constraint on the, on their block without requiring them to build their block themselves and sacrifice all the MEV that comes with like using PBS as, as their way of outsourcing it. So yeah, I think that's, that's kind of a, a TLDR and, and a big thing that, that we've been pushing for lately on the, on the censorship resistance front. Max, what do you think about inclusion lists? I think, well, I mean, first let me say that there's multiple types of censorship that we should care about. One of them is censorship for OFAC transactions like Tornado Cash, Lazarus. And I think that's what most people think about when they think about censorship resistance. And it's what's driven the recent kind of Twitter um, outrage or, or discussions about this is because a lot of the builders are censoring these transactions. So I, I think that's important, but it's less important than the overall censorship resistance, which is if I have a transaction, I should be able to quickly and cheaply get it on chain without having to pay an outsized bribe because somebody else doesn't want it there. And that could be because like the U S government doesn't want it there because it's a donation to like a terrorist group, or it could be because like I want to bid in an auction and there's a competing bidder in the auction. Right. Like those are both important for me personally. I think it's even more important to just get it generally right so that we can build good mechanisms on the chain. And like, DeFi innovation is completely stalled because of this bottleneck. And like everybody's so focused on like letting Lazarus Group have a playground that they're not worried about like the fact that this is a huge issue for app design. And I really wish we would focus more on discussions around what the apps need to function rather than like just these specific OFAC concerns. And I think Whoa. censorship inclusion lists don't actually help with the thing I care about, which is app design considerations. How, what, what app design, like, yeah, I guess you said after de DeFi design has stalled. What do you think is enabled if you have like more strong immediate inclusion guarantees? Uh, well. I, I think it breaks open a bunch of like hard nuts to crack. One of them, we call it the LVR problem or the loss first rebalancing problem with these uh, decentralized exchanges that are leaking a bunch of value to takers. That's one of them that it solves immediately because you can just hold the auction on chain. Whereas if you actually talk to the people who are trying to solve this, because the chain is deficient in this aspect of censorship resistance, and maybe we should call it short-term censorship resistance, what they've been forced to do is actually leave the chain for a lot of their execution logic, which is the auction itself, and just not have it on the chain at all because the chain is deficient in this aspect, right? And that's not, I think, the world that we want to see because once you start adding centralized and external entities, you don't have decentralized finance anymore. You have centralized finance with sprinkles on top, right? Yeah, okay. Like, Let me, let me just ask this, though. And maybe Mike will have an opinion on this with regard to, to Ethereum scaling. How much should we be optimizing for app design on the L1 to begin with, right? Like, because this is something that I think is, this is part of the discussion. Like, people want to use Ethereum L1 block space. Like, somebody recently described it as kind of Lindy, and, that, and that's true. Like, it at this point, if you're using Ethereum L1 block space, you kind of know how to use it. It's this fragmentation of consensus, which we can get to later. But it there may be different choices and you guys can tell me if i'm not thinking about this correctly but there may be different choices in terms of building out the layer one if okay l1 is just going to be settling proofs at this point right like so how much are we optimizing for like traders on uni v3 versus uh yeah I'm, go ahead mike yeah no i i think this is a really good point and in general i guess kind of circling back to max's idea that like apps would be better if the protocol made different decisions about censorship, it also feels like, yeah, 
the protocol could be made a lot better for app designers if like for example the slot time was reduced you know like and this is all kind of begging the question of like if we want people to transact on the l1 then and like apps to be built natively there then the des- the design decisions probably like change significantly and and start to look a lot more like the monolithic version and um yeah i i think given like conditioned on the fact that that we're on this like roll up centric roadmap and we're trying to um like allow scaling through this like layered approach i think yeah building building specifically for the app designers at the l1 feels like a bit of a like a strategic mistake you know it's like ethereum should be very good at being like a credibly neutral base layer it should also provide like so- enough da so that the roll ups can can do their proof you know post their proof data and everything like that but beyond that i think if anything like making slot times longer almost makes more sense and like trying to do whatever it takes to make that activity go to the l2s and encourage people to like build their apps in and deploy their apps on on those environments rather than on ethereum base chain like makes a lot of sense honestly and i think it, this ethereum is still valuable in this world because it it is like the source of truth it's the ledger of record for ether the asset which is like a very important collateral asset that hopefully will be used like across the L2s and also it's it's like providing this this pure like extremely good censorship resistance in terms of if something goes wrong on the L2 you can still force include down onto the L1 and like bridge your tokens to a different L2 where you're not being like censored like that type of censorship resistance feels much different than something that you would design for the L1 to handle like trading activity or or auctions like really smoothly you know what i mean so i guess that's maybe where the distinction in how we think about censorship resistance and how we sh- we think about like what ethereum is designing for comes from yeah i think that's that a reasonable argument but i do think that l2s care about censorship resistance as well right maybe they're not as time sensitive but uh certainly they do care about it and one example is like an optimistic roll up that has a seven uh day fraud window because seven days is like the amount of time that they need to guarantee a fraud proof gets in right uh i think like these kinds of questions are are also important for l2s but also we have a lot of activity on the chain that's just people who are using the chain for yeah i mean people still want to use ethereum l1 like hey this is like part of the like i guess this is kind of part of the irony. It's like there's still just a lot of people getting sandwiched every day on Uniswap, you know. And like if, if if this wasn't, if this was if if most of this was pushed already to these L2s, then we'd be having a different conversation. In, in which case, maybe we would be focused more on the type of censorship persistence that, that you're talking about with letting Lazarus have their you know get the, get their transactions included or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you're right. Like there's 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 still a lot of transaction volume on the l1 um i mean what what is your inclination max like are are you like do you look at ethereum and say like we need to optimize to the best we can still at least for you know l1 volume well i, I think like either ethereum optimizes this or somebody else does it and eats ethereum's lunch right if first of all like if ethereum all ethereum provides is a da layer that's like very undifferentiated and there's plenty of places that are going to be able to provide that for a lot cheaper than Ethereum. Like the thing that Ethereum is providing, why everybody's willing to pay the rents is because there's an active financial ecosystem on the L1 and they're paying rent for users basically. Like, so if we say, Oh, we're going to give up on users. Somebody else is not going to do that. Maybe Solana, maybe somebody else. And they're going to end up with the users because they're going to end up with the apps that work and users like that. So like we can give up and we can say, we're going to be a DA layer. I don't think that's a great direction because I don't think that there's a lot of optionality there in terms of how you can distinguish yourself. Um, Like what, what makes you better than Bitcoin then if you're a long slot time DA layer, right? I thought we were supposed to be a smart contract layer. Like, uh, I guess we can verify the proofs, maybe that that might be it, but so can everybody else. Yeah, I, I think competing with like a monolithic Solana style chain is just like not 
actually what Ethereum is going to differentiate itself on, right? Like, I, I totally agree with you that I don't think we should be just a DA layer because I don't think we're going to be able to compete with Celestia on that axis either. And I guess in my mind, it, it feels like doing enough DA so that the optimistic rollups, like the, the, the really like high value optimistic rollups can still use Ethereum for DA. And then providing both the kind of the kind of home base for ether the asset and the canonical bridges and also that like world war three grade censorship resistance and decentralization that is really what differentiates differentiates ethereum from from these other chains right like i don't know trying to compete on execution and like app ux with solana is just like fighting on their turf and all of the design decisions up to this point have been made around keeping solo stakers and keeping that long tail of decentralization like if you give up on that then i don't even yeah like all of the all of the historical context kind of goes goes by the wayside and we should just do the monolithic chain you know what i mean like that that doesn't feel like the right trade-off to make given where ethereum is now i think i think we should not completely abandon it though i think it's 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 not a dichotomy between like focusing all in on execution and focusing all in like this would also solve the censorship resistance problem in a much more robust way than a inclusion list if we focused on solving short-term censorship resistance because okay wait can, would, you, can you just exp okay sorry go ahead i just wanted you to flesh that out for us yeah for sure i i think we need to address the economic problem which is that there isn't enough economic incentive to get transactions onto the chain rather than trying to go and like rely on altruism which is what we've relied on and i think what we will continue to rely on maybe disagree mike in, in these inclusion lists basically we're making an implicit assumption that somebody somewhere along the line is willing to go and bypass ofac sanctions uh out of the kindness of their heart for u.s persons and other persons in you know western democracies that is not a decision that they're going to make lightly so they need to be compensated for that so we need to address the economic issues here. So we're really relying on the solo stakers to act out of the kindness of their heart and do this. Well, I would rather have a system in place where they're not, they're getting rewarded for, for violating OFAC. They're actually making more money if they do that. Inclusionists don't fix the economic problem with censorship resistance, which is that if people want you off the chain, they can pay to have you off the chain, whether that's through penalties, whether that's through bribes, whatever, through the PBS auction. If people don't want you getting onto the chain right now, there's one and only one source that they get to go to. Under inclusion list, that would be two sources, right? Uh, each block. But over like a long period, I think that kind of washes out. It's just a factor of two. Um, if we could somehow fix the problem of a single or only two people being able to include you, I think that would be a lot stronger in order to achieve the same goal than just having, just going from one to two, right? I think we need to go from one to many, one to and not one to two. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Can you, because, and and we've kind of talked a little bit about this historically, Max, this whole like, and the proposer monopoly thing. And I, there's actually like a new, um, kind of research direction that Barnabé has like been pushing for. And like, it's definitely this whole multiplicity thing is, is something that we want to learn more about. So could you just kind of explain how you expect, how you expect the mechanism to work kind of in Ethereum terms and in, yeah, like how, how does this work? Because when I hear the mechanism, it, it almost always sounds like this executing chart, execution sharding thing, which to me, like was part of the roadmap that didn't, um, end up like materializing because of technical reasons. So I'm, I'm wondering if there's some like relation here that we can draw. Yeah. So the basic idea is that more than one person should be allowed to add to the chain in a 12 second period, right? So how do we get there? We have more than one proposer. The, the issue with execution charting, which was a similar idea, is that there was an idea that this would increase the throughput of the chain because we'd have 10 people proposing blocks. So we'd have 10 times as many blocks and we'd be faster, right? But then you had to figure out how to weave the transactions together. And that was the technically difficult part. But from the perspective of inclusion for something like a transfer, for something like a 
tornado cash transaction where you're depositing or not depositing, that doesn't need to be in any particular order in the block. That's actually like not related to other state necessarily. Another example of something like that is a bid in an auction or the execution of an option or something like this that doesn't really depend on the ordering at all. And for those transactions, you don't need to figure out how to weave them in. You can just say they're in there. Let's execute them all at the end. It doesn't matter the order because they're order agnostic. Uh, and so in that situation, it's just very easy to take the union. And there's no technical difficulty in how to interleave these together. So I think that's that's like the difference here between that and, and execution sharding. Yeah, it actually sounds, you know, what you're describing sounds almost like an inclusion list that's constructed by multiple proposers, right? Because the inclusion list has many similar constraints as far as like, we're, we're not guaranteeing anything about ordering or like pre-state, post-state of the transaction. We're just saying like, it will get included. So I do think there's this, um, yeah, that property sounds similar. It's almost like you just want multiple people to be able to construct an inclusion list per slot. And critically, I want it to happen in a timely manner, not one slot in advance, right? I, I think it needs to happen right away, not 12 seconds away for, for yeah. app design reasons. I think... You know, if, if you're already willing to wait 12 seconds, for most applications, you're probably willing to wait the amount of time it would take to to get on, even in a, in a world where a lot of people are trying to keep you off. But if you're playing DeFi games, you, you need to get on immediately. And that's why the list needs to be more than two, and it needs to be in the same slot as the execution is going to happen. So I guess in this world, it would be like, you have 10 people propose candidate lists of transactions. And these are all the, the transactions that are like eligible for inclusion. Um, and how does the execution happen in that case then? Because if it's in the same slot, we need someone to do, like determine the final ordering, right? Yeah, you, you can have any number of, of orderings, but one is just to, to have like what's called serial dictatorship, which sounds a lot worse than it is, which is just to have the first of the N proposers order all their transactions. And then the second guy comes in and puts his transactions. And then the third guy puts his transactions and anything that's kind of in multiple blocks will be uh, placed at the highest point, right? That it was placed by the first guy versus the second guy, et cetera. So you, there's a bunch of simple, very simple ordering rules. You can have one. Well, but guy. that but that just sounds that just sounds like you're making the block times ten times shorter, right? If you just do it sequentially like that. Uh it's it's like, not the same because like from uh the perspective of um holding like an auction, right? You want everybody's bids to come in at the same time. You don't want some people to have to bid earlier than others just because they're more likely to be censored. Like if everybody's trying to wait for information about the world to be revealed. It's very different to have 12 people proposing a block at the end of a 12 second period than one person proposing a block every every second. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Okay, let's like zoom out for one second. I just have a more high level question for both you guys. Uh, so Bill Diane, who's the uh, kind of considered the godfather of MEV, I think he's been referred to that before, uh, the like head of Flashbots, um, he gave a talk, I don't know, a couple years ago now. This was like probably at the beginnings of like the, the real MEV discussions. And he brought up a very interesting point, which I've always thought about this um, with r regards to a system having a lot of MEV versus a system having a lot, uh, not a lot of MEV. Um, okay, but he, he, that was a little bit garbled. Here's his point. He was saying that proposers should have the right, like as the monopolistic power for 12 seconds they should have the right to put whatever they want inside of a block um and he sort of compared this to like you know if you're i forget what he said maybe like the postal service like and you know you're transporting something illegal like should you have the right to to not do that because you know it's illegal to do that and and the essence of it was look if like when you are chosen as one of you know many proposers uh should you have the right to include um, or not include whatever transactions you want. Interestingly enough, Vitalik, this is sort of the inverse of this. I don't know if it's exactly the inverse, but I'm giving the other side of this. Uh, Vitalik has sort of said, look, like ideally, 
long run, we have a system where proposers aren't actually aware of the contents of the block. Like they they really have no idea what they're adding to the blockchain. They don't know what what the what the transaction type is, who who it's coming from. Um, I think this is sort of like uh, what what is it like? Um, not not threshold encryption. What's it called? Like it, just en- encrypted encrypt- mempool. Like encrypted mempool. Yeah. Generally. Yeah. yeah. So like I don't know. It it is interesting. And the reason the reason I want to ask you two is because I think I, I thought about this, and I don't know if this is apt or not. But like with something like Bitcoin, um, the premise is that eventually somebody will include your transaction if you pay a sufficient fee, right? With something like Ethereum, maybe this this dynamic changes a bit with the existence of, of a very <laughs> large amount of MEV and and the ability to extract more from a protocol, it changes this dynamic a lot, right? Because someone can theoretically censor you forever and it not cost them much. And this is like what I, when I'm talking about, like where I want to zoom out, it's like, this is a, this is an interesting, Mike, you're looking like you're already disagreeing with the premise. Well, I guess I, I don't, I don't see how it costs you more in Ethereum to censor or how it caught. Co- yeah. How, how it costs more in Bitcoin to censor than in Ethereum. Just because of the base fee, like, is that the only difference? Well, I mean, actually, primarily because of, there's not a tremendous amount of MEV on Bitcoin. Like, in theory, <laughs> there's there's not there's not a lot of um, it's like I'm, I'm trying to think of a way to say this. It's not th- th- that's not just sort of like uh, it it's primarily peer to peer transactions, right? It's like, if you pay, right? like the sorry? fees are dominated by the MEV, and so like. The transaction fee that you pay is just negligible relative to the other things that the builder is doing. Isn't that is that what you're saying? Because there are so many ways to make money with how you order transactions in Ethereum, right? Like there's so many external ways that builders make money. They can just not include somebody if if they're it it, it, it doesn't cost them a lot to not include somebody, right? Like o- over a, a large <laughs> sample size, it may not cost them a lot. You're, you're disagreeing again. We're going to have to edit. But it, it it doesn't cost a Bitcoin miner anything to leave a transaction out either. Like Bitcoin profits for miners are dominated by the, the issuance from the protocol, not from fees, right? Like it doesn't cost them anything to leave it all out. But it, it, if you have a transaction that has like a $100 priority fee on Ethereum right now, it does cost, you know, Beaver Build or whoever quite a bit to not include them every block because... <laughs> Uh, they may have, they may be winning already, but if they included that transaction, they would be getting a hundred dollars more, right? Yeah. So that makes it sound like Ethereum has a higher cost of censorship. No, I think it's the same. It's like, it's like the same cost. It's yeah, just, yeah. I think it's, I think when, it's the same. When the builders are, have like a bunch of revenue that's coming from other sources, I think yes, this, it, it may this. be that it gets dwarfed, the, right? The bulk of fees in Bitcoin are like, in, oh my God, it's purely a transaction fee, right? Like, whereas in 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 Ethereum, you could theoretically censor for for a period of time, or m- maybe indefinitely, because you're making so much money elsewhere. Do you, do you not agree with this premise? I'm 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 really not articulating this well, I guess. No, no, I guess in my mind, it's like if you look at the total revenue of a, of a Bitcoin miner, like the fees are nothing anyway. So just leave the whole transaction empty and just mine the block. But every, right? like, like every miner has the same like block reward, whereas Beaver has a different reward for their block. Yes, yes, there we go. This, this, this is what I'm saying. Yards. This is what I'm saying. Yes, yes. So but even, because of exogenous ways to make money. Right. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> In no. Bitcoin, the difference between the best block packer and the and the worst block packer is like nothing. Yes, in yes. Ethereum, precisely. the difference between the best block packer and the second best block packer is so much bigger. Like, is orders and orders of magnitude bigger than the difference between the best Bitcoin block packer and the and the worst one? Right, but in in terms of like the actual distribution of people producing blocks. That doesn't mean that like ninety nine percent of blocks are packed by Beaver. You know what I mean? It's like if if that outcome led to beaver packing all the blocks i would agree but because there still is like a number of builders and there is like a tale of of like solo stakers that are proposing their own blocks 
they okay, they're okay. producing like fifty percent. Sometimes. Let, let me, right? yeah, yeah. Let me, let me flip this on. Let me, let me, let me ask this question in another way. Okay, why is Beaver able to censor OFAC transactions and not assume that that is over a large enough sample size a death knell for their business? Like, effectively, blockchain should be designed such that if you are willing to censor continuously over the long run, right? That should be like you will not compete. But you, would you agree or no? It's the well, tension release. The, itself, that's, that's it's definitely not how Bitcoin is designed. Like if if a Bitcoin miner produces twenty percent of blocks and censors OFAC transactions on Bitcoin, they're not going to go to zero. Like their twenty percent is still going to be twenty percent of the hash rate. But they're gonna yeah. they're gonna be paying they're gonna be paying more. Like their their competitive advantage in terms of the yeah exactly like in, in theory. Software. In theory, the competitive advantage over like over the long run by censoring should decrease. Like that that is what we are trying to do here, I think. Right? Like or no, no. But okay. The, the problem, I think the thing that we're not talking about is that the tension of like a bunch of OFAC transactions that want to get in gets released as soon as they get in. And there aren't that many of them. Like there just aren't like a huge volume of them paying high right. tips. And they come into the mempool. And then eventually there's a block which Beaver and Titan are like competitive enough that Titan ends up winning because they have the extra transaction. And then that relieves all the tension and, and Beaver can go back to winning blocks while they're censoring. Mike? Thoughts or no? Um, I, yeah. I guess, so maybe the thing that yeah. you're saying is that like the marginal, like let's take issuance and block reward out of the equation. Like, block reward for bitcoin and and issuance for yes, ethereum yes. the difference between like a bitcoin miner leaving out a transaction and beaver leaving out a transaction is like very different between how competitive they are with the other builders in their respective ecosystem is that what you're saying correct correct okay i think yeah i think i follow that um yeah i'm not sure that I'm not sure that like not having any MEV in the ecosystem is the right way to deal with it, right? <laughs> like that's no, but no, no, no. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not disagreeing on that. I think I'm more pointing out that when there are exogenous, like, and once again, this is already like very loosely defined, like, and and also we don't like to the T. We don't know exactly how much Beaver and Rsync and Titan are making, right? Because they have all this money elsewhere. They have all this money on Binance. They have all this money, you know, like. All, all, on these exchanges and dexes and other chains and so on and so forth. So like, but because there is ways to make money outside of the protocol, they can potentially, potentially, okay, maybe you disagree with the premise, still censor and continue to gain market share potentially again without once again, like what, now going back to what you were saying, like losing maybe their competitive <laughs> advantage. And, and if anything, like I think, the numbers sort of support this occurring in practice, right? Like, like Beaver continues to gain market share. So I don't know what you guys think of this. But it's not like, this is the point I'm making about relieving the tension. It's like, well, there is an OFAC transaction paying a fee. Titan has an advantage, right? Because they're including it. So then they are, are able to pay more. And even if, if Beaver wins, they have to pay more for the block because Titan is willing to pay more for the block. Right. So as like every block that Beaver doesn't include this transaction, that's another little plus in the in the Titan column, right? And so even if Beaver yep. continues to win, they have to pay more every block that they win. And eventually, like there's a point at which there's like no MEV going on, or you know something good for Titan happens and Titan wins, or some other builder wins and includes the transaction, and then that takes the transaction out of the mempool, and now like the next block we're back to even playing field. So it doesn't yeah. necessarily like build up and make it so that you're uncompetitive in every block. It's like a little advantage. And again, it is little because there just aren't that many transactions and they don't pay that much. And EIP 1559 makes them pay even less. And like that little advantage is not enough to outweigh the advantage that Beaver has in terms of other MEV extraction ability. Yeah. Okay. So then... Go ahead, Mike. No, I I think that that whole like line of reasoning makes sense to me. Like, 
Um, okay. I guess I'm not I'm not convinced that like there's a good way to accurately like allow or like reward someone for reward someone more accurately for participating in the censorship resistance. You know what I mean? No, I don't like, think there is. No, no, no. I I I don't think there is. Yeah. Well, there is, there is. If you if you have multiple proposers, then you can charge conditional tips, and you can and you can make it really costly to censor. Let's zoom back out, but in a different way. Uh, what like are you guys concerned about the centralization that we're seeing in builders right now? Yeah, for sure. I think. Um, yeah, I guess in terms of. All the the three major builders like Beaver, Rsync, and and Titan, all are like competing for the HFT like centralized exchange decentralized exchange flow. Um, both Beaver and and S, uh, both Beaver and Rsync are like generating that flow internally. Titans like externalizing where they get that flow from. But yeah, the fact that like almost all of the the value in the block is being dominated by that feels like a real problem and i guess just in terms of like also the memetics of having three entities produce like 90 ish percent of ethereum blocks is just like feels like a really bad look do you see the proposer monopoly stuff this like multiplicity um gadget as like addressing builder centralization like is that a vector to deal with builder centralization yeah because the, the reason that builder centralization exists is because the apps cannot design in a way that doesn't leak mev there's, there's user demand for apps on Ethereum, like financial applications, clearly. Users are using apps, right? And the only way to design an app that meets the demand is to leak a ton of MEV, which takes quite a bit of skill to harvest, right? Like, for example, these AMMs, which are leaking a bunch of money every year, and, and the liquidations, which are leaking a bunch of money, right? Uh, if you allow the apps to solve those problems by giving them better tools, then the difference between the best builder, no matter how much smarter they are, and the second best builder will be smaller, right? Mm -hmm. Or the difference between the top three and the rest will be smaller because no longer do you have these 60 ETH opportunities coming along that only a few people can harvest because they have a trading firm in the backyard. If if most of the like let's let's take the premise that most of the competitive edge of these builders is from their like sex decks arbing, then no matter like how well you design, I guess that then you're just saying like we need like the AMMs on chain to be better designed to not leak that MEV. That's what you're saying. So suppose like there's two there's there's two levels of like some world, right? There's like people on the top level who walk around carrying water buckets from one place to the other, right? And these guys make money by bringing water back and forth, okay? And then there's people on the bottom level who like pick up the water and they put the water back in the reservoir or something like that, right? Or maybe they just pick up the water and they make money with the water. The more water they get, the, the more money they make. If you give everybody at the top level a leaky bucket, and so they're always leaking water down to the second level, then the people on the bottom level who are best at at collecting water are going to have way more water than everybody else because there's tons of opportunities for them coming down the pipes, right? If you give them a, a bucket that actually holds the water, there's less water coming down to the, the basement level. And now, no matter how good at collecting water you are, there's only so much more water you can have than anybody else because there's only so much water coming down. Like this is the same idea. If you, there's people who want to have water up at the top level. At the app level, there's people who want to trade. And the only thing we've done is say, here's the le leaky bucket. Go ahead and provide them X times Y equals K A M M iteration 15. And unfortunately, it's going to keep leaking because we refuse to address censorship resistance. And now we're all worried about the fact that there's like somebody's really good at picking up the water who's building 50% of the blocks. Well, just stop leaking the water, you know? But is is the leaky bucket because of censorship resistance or because of long slot times? Like, is, the, is Uniswap's design constrained by the fact that like, like is AMM design limited by the fact that you don't have like real-time censorship resistance guarantees on chain? No, like it's 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 limited by that fact exactly because we have an auction that captures the revenue. We have the PBS auction capturing the revenue, right? Like somebody's capturing it 
the value is capturing it. If the chain could run the auction itself, it could run the exact same auction and it could capture it and give it back to the LPs, right? So if the chain could just run an auction, it would be able to run an auction which is just as effective as a PBS auction, capture 95% of the revenue, and the amount of water that would be leaking down, the amount of MEV would be reduced by 95% for that particular opportunity. So you're saying the the weakness of the protocol censorship resistance allows or like disallows auctions to be conducted on chain that would re- rebate that value back to the LPs. Right. So then the auction has to happen off chain, right? Yeah. Through the PBS auction. And the PBS auction captures a bunch of revenue. Like if you look at the look yeah. at the opportunities here, it's really in the realm of 95% on on the major pairs, right? And we could Im- feasibly imagine that happening one layer up at the app layer if we just gave them the right tools to do it. Okay, wait, can you can you just clarify for a second? What 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 auction mechanism are you talking about here that the protocol itself should be running with the buckets and the leak gear buckets? <laughs> okay. So we need like, like a grand theory here. Pull it all yeah, yeah. Like what are, you, what, are you, what are you referring to? <laughs> There's users who want to trade on the chain who want to trade ETH for USDC, right? The only way, the best way we figured out to do that on the current Ethereum chain is to run what effectively is next times Y equals K uh, AMM with a few extra steps, which is Uniswap V3, right? Everything else that's like on chain for trading is either worse or has a centralized entity. Okay. We know there's people who just like want to trade on chain. So like they have to be on chain. The best thing we know how to do is Uniswap V3 or something that looks like it. And the problem with that is prices change between blocks. And so the order book or the uh, exchange or the Uniswap V3 pool has a stale price when the when the prices change externally, okay? We know how to address that or at least to capture revenue from that opportunity because it's happening in the PBS auction. When prices change a bunch, you know, Ethereum goes from 1950 to not to 2000 in a, in a block and there's a huge arbitrage opportunity, the price to win the block in the PBS auction is much higher. Why? Because there's a bunch of people who know how to capture the opportunity and they bid in the auction, right? So feasibly, you could have that auction in the protocol if the protocol was able to run the auction. Instead, it's happening at the PBS layer because you can't run it internally. You need to ask Binance to tick every 12 seconds. This has always been my idea. I put forth, I've, I've said this multiple times. If you went <laughs> to Binance and said, would you mind moving ETH prices every 12 seconds? It would call it would like truly solve so many problems. <laughs> yeah. And then they, and then like you would still have the same issue because some other exchange would come about and, uh, and do continuous pricing. Right. Okay. Mike, you can respond seriously. Sorry. <laughs> no, I, I think, I think I am following your, your line of reasoning, which is, Basically, like, I guess to, to put a cap on it or to try and summarize, um, real-time censorship resistance has, like, real impacts in terms of what app design can can be created. And that, in turn, that app design can thus reduce the total amount of MEV produced by the system, thus reducing the centralization um, of the builder market in the first place. Like, it seems like that's the, the three-step view of what you were of what you were just saying with the the bucket analogy and yeah i think if that's if that's correct then or like uh, that that train of thought makes sense to me what i'm not so sold on here so far is that like there's a good design that like works to get this like real-time censorship resistance property like that's what i think is more of the unknown in my mind like everything that follows after feels intuitive in, in some regard Max, can can you show us your design if you don't mind? Uh, yeah, I can. Like, I mean, I, we need to. First of all, I'm not like a distributed systems person, so there's people who are better at this than me, which is why I haven't like gone in and fully specked out like here's how this would actually work. But the basic idea that we've suggested, one idea is called multiplicity, which is 
you have a single proposer still, but that when the proposer sends the block off to the attesters to attest to, the attesters can add bids or other things that need to be included in their attestation. So I think on Cosmos, they call this like ABCI plus plus or something, but I like to call it multiplicity because that's what we called it, Elijah and I. But uh, the idea is very simple. It's just put the bids in a place where we already have a bunch of collective input, which is the attesters, and let them do the censorship resistance for you. Yeah, I think I, I think these types of things do make sense in general in terms of like relying on the validator set being honest majority to to like contribute their data to to the protocol. I guess I I'm not sure from like the implementation perspective if if the date like how this changes the data requirements, right? Like if each attest if each attestation has to come with a bundle of transactions, it's like almost the equivalent of like a bunch of blocks being passed around the network simultaneously, which I'm not sure how that would how that would work out. But yeah, I think the the right path forward here is to like think through how how this design would apply in in the Ethereum context and like try and try and spec it out. Yeah, but like again, I'm like a mechanism designer. I can tell you that like economically what you're doing doesn't make sense, but I'm not going to I'm not like a distributed systems engineer. Luckily, we have plenty of very smart people, <laughs> you know. And this is again yeah. where I'll plug where I'll plug uh Barnabas uh rig open problem you know, like he's explicitly asking people and soliciting feedback and help on this exact problem, this multiplicity thing. So hopefully like someone listening to this can come figure it out. Yeah. Uh, okay. So what is somebody tell me what Suave is and <laughs> is Suave happening? Well, actually, wait, let me, let me take that back. Look, this is another blockchain. What we're talking about is another blockchain, right? So like, is this something though that the protocol uh, like Ethereum Foundation or the community is working with Flashbots because I mean Flashbots I think is sort of this you know public good allegedly that has built you know a lot of a lot of the MEV infrastructure right uh, is this something that for example Mike are you like working with Flashbots on Swab or is this like uh, now like sort of a separate project? Yeah, no, there's there's no like formal relationship between. I guess Flashbots and the Ethereum Foundation, and like I think they're both just like actors in the space. What I see Suave as is kind of their their vision for what a distributed and like privacy first block builder could be, right? Like this idea, it, it's almost like a private mempool, like an encrypted mempool, where transactions get sent to these Suave nodes that are running in this um, in this TE environment, and the block construction or the bundle construction happens in that trusted environment before being forwarded onto the builder. So I think that's kind of the, at least that's the vision of Suave that I've heard pitched. Um, I'm not like, I, I can't comment specifically on like what their long-term roadmap and stuff is, but I think it's a real credible push in that direction of trying to like make uh, block building slightly more decentralized and, and try and capture some of this like cryptography and like, encrypted mempool um, magic that comes from being able to run in the TEE. Like that's, that's to me what I see as, as the real value add. What I think is, is remaining to be seen in my mind is like, just in terms of competing on the block building scale, like we were talking about earlier, it takes like huge amounts of sophistication to compete and um, lots of like liquidity on exchanges and stuff like that. Um, what's not clear to me is like, Suave feels like it's premised on the fact that they get so much exclusive order flow through the Suave TEEs that they can just like outcompete purely based on order flow and not have to compete on the other dimensions that the builders are are fighting over. So I think that's where the proof will have to like come in the pudding just in terms of like both performance in order flow and like latency optimizations and stuff that that goes into the engineering side. I'll pass it off to Max. Yeah, maybe I should plead the fifth on this one, but I guess like the, I think I've been bearish through several iterations of what Suave is. Um, I think the builder part of it came about at a time when Flashbots was winning tons of blocks in the early PBS auction because they had a bunch of order flow that nobody else had. 
namely flashbots protect right and and they also like in some ways were technically more capable because they had built the system and they knew what the intricacies of the relays were and um so like they had a lot of advantages at the time and i think they thought maybe incorrectly that building was easier than it ended up being um so that's one thing i think there's other things that swap can do but let me just talk about this specifically decentralized builder thing there's a there's a story that if you leave your laptop unlocked around the paradigm office somebody will come and like put a script into your terminal that every time you type a command uh sleeps for one second and uh it's like sleeps one second more every time you run a command i think that's like what has happened in the swab design is just like continually like adding latency after latency after latency and layer after layer after layer and this is a high frequency setting and you can't just like delay yourself for one second even but certainly like more than one second is absolute no-go we'll see if they are able to attract enough order flow to compete despite that huge latency disadvantage which is furthered by sgx but I, I doubt that they'll be successful at block building. Other stuff, maybe we'll see. Selling Taylor Swift tickets, who knows? You know, I'll give Taylor a call and, and see if she's interested. But uh, yeah, on that note, what do you? You've uh, talked recently about these timing games, right? Uh, that builders are playing, um, and also I know this is adjacent, but like, are you concerned about? the centralization vectors of the necessity for extremely good latency. I mean, like, I think this, the short answer is yes, but what is, what are, what are both you guys, like, how do you look at this and, and you see like how imperative speed and good connectivity and fiber optic mm -hmm. is at this point, you know, like, is this something that's very concerning or, I mean, Mike's going to say 10 minute block, block times, we're good to go, but <laughs> what do you got? What are you guys like seeing right now in terms of latency and, and also maybe like, uh -huh more high level like is this concerning for like the long term like are we trending back just towards hft games co-location same type stuff yeah it's funny um max and i were literally on like a twitter spaces an hour and a half ago um literally all about timing games so maybe the the most interested listener can can go listen to that recording um but yeah i guess in, in short, like very concerned about latency and timing games. Like I think this is not only it, it increases the amount of sophistication to accurately like and, and profitably participate in this in this protocol, but also just in terms of like speed of light geographic decentralization things like, um, you know, the co-location becomes like a very strongly centralizing force. And it also becomes a vector by which like you fall into one specific jurisdiction, right? Like if if all of the builders are running a US East one and like Europe West, whatever, or, or like maybe the, the data center in Tokyo, then like the US government and the Japanese government would have like a lot more influence over potentially what could happen. Um, and I think this is why Phil, like Phil in a lot of ways has like been skating ahead of the puck for a really long time. Like he published this post called You Should Be a, a Geographic Decentralization Maxi. Um, or like why Ethereum needs you to be this or something like that. So definitely refer to him to check that out. He has, and like, I, again, this kind of feels a bit like an impossibility result. Like, I don't know that there's any good answer to like, yeah, like of course things that are centralized and vertically integrated are going to be more efficient and like they're going to make more money. I think maybe making sure that like it's still possible to run a solo staker from like South America, even if like, you're not as profitable as as running in in the beaver build data center um but yeah I, it's it's super concerning and i don't know that like there's a cut and dry like this is how you fix latency like these things are like really inherent to to the systems i think yeah i think like the other difference here is in tradfi they've learned how to harness these timing games well first of all let me say these these are games. And so what matters is not being fast, but being faster than the other person. It's kind of like in chess at the highest level, at the engine level, 3,500 level chess, white is like the only person who ever wins a game. Uh, 
in in these engine matches right black almost never wins and it's true even at the grandmaster level at the highest grandmaster level like that simple tempo advantage of moving first just gives you so much of an advantage actually this game is more about moving after the other guys having more information seeing things later um in terms of what happens on chain but what i'm saying is in TradFi, they've learned how to harness these latency games. So while they are paying a ton of money for microwave towers to go from 13 milliseconds to 12 sec- milliseconds, which is not admittedly a great use of money if you're kind of the social planner, what they are doing is they're fixing the leaks in the bucket in the system. Why? Because in TradFi, they have this price time priority mechanism. In Crypto, we only have uh, price priority. In TradFi, it's price time priority. And so if you're the first person to pick off a stale quote, you get to pick off the stale quote. What that means is as soon as a quote gets stale in TradFi, it gets picked off, so it doesn't get any more stale. So as soon as something gets stale, it gets picked off and, and you cut your losses as soon as possible. So as you get faster and faster in the system, as these games start to go on, you have less and less stale quotes on the books because they get picked off immediately before they can lose any substantial amount of money. And of course, this doesn't work when there's a huge jump in the price, but as long as the price is moving kind of relatively continuously, we actually know how to harness latency. Now flip that back to crypto, we don't know how to harness latency. And so all of the money that's getting spent on, you know, getting faster, these HFT games, I think is just dead weight loss, basically going to trying to beat the next guy and, and not improving spreads for anybody, not uh, improving the leakiness of the bucket at all. Yeah. I mean, there's also like regulatory constraints that a lot of these HFT guys have to comp- have to work with in TradFi, right? Like best bid or whatever, national best bid. Like there there are <laughs> there are rules. We don't have rules, which is also what makes it fun, I suppose. Um cool. Okay, well, uh all right. We've talked a lot about MEV. I feel like uh we pretty much solved it for that matter. Uh w- once Max sends over his idea and has Mike and the distributed systems guys actually put it into production code. Uh, okay, let's just talk about maybe something else the last bit. Uh, what do you guys think about how Max, I think, has some opinions on this, how Ethereum core devs are funded, um, the protocol guild, are there, like, are there skewed incentives? Are we doing a good job with how we finance the people who build these systems? Either one of you. Mike, it's kind of geared towards you i guess if you want to go first or max okay I, I'll, I'll say a tiny thing and then pass it to max which is just like um yeah obviously very biased as a member of the protocol guild but i think what what it's trying to do makes a lot of sense which is kind of um at, at the more human layer like realign the incentives between like contributing to something that that benefits like a lot of people this public good of ethereum as a protocol um and also just like encourage people to to continue like like i think a lot of people like get opportunities once they've kind of made made their contribution to the core like, like protocol and then like take those opportunities to leave and, and thus there's like some amount of churn um like in general that that seems like something to avoid so yeah i guess the the vision of of keeping public goods alive and using like like redirecting some of the value created by those public goods to support them feels like a really noble and like worthwhile cause in the first place. Like right now, I guess the the analogy to compare to is like how open source tools are, are maintained. And generally speaking, like, like open source tools, like outside of the crypto crypto ecosystem, I'm saying um, there's kind of like a few different models here. There's like the big tech companies will just have someone on their team, like maintain this tool because it's important for their, for their long-term viability. There's like the red hat version where there's like an open source thing. And then, you know, there's open source Linux and then there's the Red Hat version where they offer support and they help kind of like cater to to the people who don't have all the technical details to run like open source software and, and make and like consume this this thing. 
Um, but yeah, I guess in general, I really like that um, that vision for for funding public goods and and keeping people involved in the community. But obviously, very biased from from a per, a protocol guild member's perspective. Yeah, I think it definitely makes sense that people who contribute to the core protocol are compensated at a level that prevents them from moving elsewhere and doing other things that aren't as beneficial to the public. I do have some, you know, concerns with the way that it's funded, which is basically we're trying to fund public goods and we we do that through what's basically charity of going to a bunch of projects, asking them to give 1% of their token supply. And I, I kind of wish it was just, you know, some, some percentage of the burn that, that went to it rather than, uh, I know that's heinous. I know that's. Wait, flat. I had no idea about this. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. has been a, a topic before. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. I, I, I honestly had no idea you thought this, Max. This is like, um, yeah, like Hayden, Hayden Adams yeah, yeah. from Uniswap has said something along these lines. So you wish the protocol itself fund. I mean, the, like as you know, the problem with this like has been the argument has been that you know this sort of takes away from the credible neutrality of of the protocol in that regard. And I don't know. I'm, I'm oh, how does it not take away from the credible neutrality of the protocol to have one percent of Uniswap tokens? I mean, that's a you know, if they, oh, have, I'm, not, I'm not saying that that's like even worse to me than just the fees. Like, Hey, we know that fees are what the protocol needs to do in the long run is generate fees. So I, I think it's actually very aligned to have people at, you know, EF having a portion of that, just like an adventure firm, you have carry in the, in the things that you invest in. But here we have a situation where I think, you know, you might have, you know, the 1% from, it's almost like, Hey, Give us 1% of your token, and then we at the F will act in a credibly neutral way, other than the fact that we have 1% of your token. So, like, we're probably not going to do anything that completely wrecks you, like enshrining your whole thing. But, like, like can you imagine if, if like, EF had 1% of Lido, and that's, like, a big portion because it's, like, venture scale returns. So, that's, like, a big portion of, of their comp is, like, in Lido tokens. And then they're like, oh, well, we, we think that enshrining delegated proof of stake at this point would be the best thing to do, but like it would also kill the Lido token valuation and we all have a bunch of Lido token. I, well, I, okay. I want to say, I want to say, <laughs> I want to say one thing here, which is that um, we're using the EF and the protocol guild as like synonyms, but they're actually like very different entities. Like the protocol guild is originally like as concepted was, was for like core devs more so than like Ethereum, foundation researchers so just just to say that like a lot of the people in the protocol guild don't necessarily like get paid by the ef they have like other funding sources um yeah in terms of like the credible neutrality um i i definitely do see your point that like it almost is like an alignment tax like if you donate one percent of your tokens to this thing then the protocol will be like designed in such a way that it's like favorable to your thing because that like is aligning your incentives with them. And also just like the memetics of like, Hey, we're, we're the good guys. We're aligned with Ethereum. I, I think that's like super damaging to like, yeah, that, that, that feels like inherently wrong to me to, I, I guess I don't feel like the social pressure on projects to donate 1%, like that shouldn't be the reason they do it. It shouldn't be like, we're shaming people who don't do it. I think it's like, um, yeah, I, I don't know that I have a good answer, honestly, for this. Yeah, Other but it's than... like tipping my doorman. Like, if, if I don't tip my doorman, right, I, it's my choice. You know, it's like whatever. I can do whatever I want, right? You would have a doorman. Okay. <laughs> I live in New York City, okay? it's uh, I live it's... in New York City, and I do not have a doorman. Oh, my God. Mike. That's because you work for the <laughs> Ethereum Foundation. You, you should go to the blocks, protocol bro. and tell them to give you some more money, Mike. <laughs> but the, the idea is, like, if you don't do this, like – it's not going to be the end of the world, but you're not going to, you know, get favorable treatment in the future. They're not going to like help you carry your bag upstairs if your arm is broken or something like this kind of. Yeah, stuff. but Max, like, okay, the, I've heard a lot of, I've heard a lot of discussions about this this premise. Like, there's a bunch of different implementations, right? But like, even if you were to say, okay, one percent of the burn should go toward maintaining the open source public good that is Ethereum, we're back 
into political games as to how that's divvied up. It's not like yeah. it, it, that doesn't remove the attribution's that, right? and, insane. And, and, like, you're right, and, and so like, and I mean, that's a non-trivial amount of money, probably. Uh, I, I actually, I, I don't know the specifics, but like, regardless, if that is the source of funding, I mean, it's not like you're not playing similar political games there. And in in a sense, like, maybe it's a bit of a stretch, but that kind of turns Ethereum into a little bit of DAO on-chain governance. I mean, that's not exactly the way to say it, but you see where I'm going with that. Like, we're we're trending. I mean. Yeah, go ahead. You're looking like maybe sort of like there's it's sort of uh, between a rock and a hard place, which I think is reasonable. But well, I think there's political games with how to how to divide up this vertical guild stuff, and it also happens to have this you know aspect of of charitable donations and aligning people with apps and not with the protocol, so that they may make decisions that are better for the apps than the protocol. Um, like, I, I don't know. I think it's a, it's part of a broader problem that I would say, like, if you join a venture firm, you have very, very strict requirements on what you're allowed to do with your other investments. So you're basically only allowed to have carry in the firm and, and hold the S&P and stuff like this, right? Like, you're not allowed to go and be an angel investor and a bunch of other stuff, whether that's, that's like stuff that's, like not in the portfolio or stuff that has nothing to do with your area. It's like, you really have a lot of severe restrictions and that's just for a venture firm, like, because they want to align the interests of the staff with the returns of the venture por portfolio. And I think like we should consider having a similar thing, uh, yeah. for people who are, you know, receiving public goods funding to work on the protocol, but they're also not, you know, getting a bunch of financial compensation from other stuff that may affect their decisions about the protocol. What do you think, Mike? I mean, I think w one, I, I guess, I guess Mike is probably going to take slight objection to comparing Ethereum to a big <laughs> venture capital firm. <laughs> um, but go ahead, M Mike, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, definitely ag agree with that sentiment. Um, I guess anything like this does make it feel a little bit more like a corporate structure. And also, like, yeah, I guess anything that touches either the asset feels, like, inherently super risky just in terms of, like, you're just taking this token and, like, giving it to your friends and then your friends are, like, you know, there's all this like insider trading, blah, blah, blah. And also like if the protocol guild, the way the protocol guild in terms of membership works now, it's like, um, it's kind of like there's this nomination process and, and you vote on like if someone's in and, and they can have like partial weight, like half allocation, or they can have like full allocation. And, like all of these things start, if, if you start like adding ether, the asset, like from the core protocol into it, it just feels like so much insider trading like back you know backroom dealing that I, I just think it's non-starter like completely dead on arrival honestly in terms of like how do you actually credibly fund public goods i think like that's what all these experiments are trying to figure out like optimism is doing the retroactive thing which you know maybe that's like in terms of al aligning people's actions with what's good for the protocol could be like considered more like better because if you make decisions about the Ethereum protocol that end up like helping something like you get rewarded for it after, but not before then that like, maybe that like path dependency is, is better. But yeah, I, I don't think there's like a cut and dry answer to like how to fund these things or how to like, how to keep people contributing to the open. I think public that Alec should pay because he's a billionaire. <laughs> And uh, he should use his funds to pay for the protocol guild. I think it's interesting because there are, pri like, as sort of as Mike was referring to, there are private companies, right, that help maintain Linux or some other open source software because it is useful for their business, right? Like, and that's sort of part of the problem, I would say. Like, ideally, we'd have all these apps and they have developers that help, like, I'm using Uniswap here, not for any specific reason, but, like, Uniswap helps in some capacity maintain the Ethereum protocol because 
Okay. That is where it's like um, they're building cars, right? They're, they build cars, and so they, they help finance the highways because they will sell more cars as a result of that. Like, it, they need— No, I mean, need... this is already happening, though. Like, this is happening, right? Like, Paradigm yeah, yeah, yeah. has so, wrath. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. Like, Off-Chain Labs, yeah, the yeah, company that runs Arbitrum, mm-hmm. like, acquired right, Prism. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is definitely okay. happening. Okay, well— <laughs> Oh my god, that's okay. That is so fucking fake, by the way. I'm so mad about this. Like, somebody posted a fake benchmark of Besu, and then like everybody's like trolling Besu when it's literally the same performance of Geth. And somebody just posted a fake benchmark. Like, we just ran the benchmark, like, not that. It's like within 1% of the performance of Geth. And somebody posted a fake benchmark, and now everybody's trolling Besu. But I, nobody on in consensus on Twitter, but I will say this. We. Uh, do not agree with that benchmark because if you actually run the benchmark and don't fake the results, then it's completely different than that than that result. Okay. I think those those results got like taken withdrawn and in the all core devs they like talked about how those weren't accurate. Yeah. So Yeah, but, but yeah, somehow I... on Twitter everybody still thinks Besu is, you know, <laughs> not great when it's like literally the same performance as Gath. So Yeah. I think Rath R- 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 is a good example to me wrath wrath is a good example of a private company taking georgios and making him write an, an entire ethereum client but but in all seriousness right like that would be an example some of the other examples of public goods funding like i mean come on look it's it's pretty, it's pretty absurd sometimes like let's be honest but we don't have to get too much into that right now that um okay this has been fantastic we have to end with probably the most pressing question or the most interesting question. What do you think Ethereum alignment means and how, how important is it? And like, uh, what, what did you see come of that discussion debate? I don't know. Yeah. Like I think it basically started with like L2s that pay rent to the L1 for like a shitty DA layer, but the DA layer has uses like it has users. So like they pay rent, in the form of like fifty thousand dollars a day of gas fees to use this da layer which they don't actually need to use because they could use like another one that works better and then they get users because they're like an l2 right but really i think they're basically their own chain for the most part with like a little more security guarantees and they're they're paying rent on the main chain to like get users mike <laughs> yeah i guess i don't want it Ethereum alignment to be a crutch that is like just a social tool to get people to use Ethereum. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think it's a very good outcome if we're depending on like the social layer super heavily to incentivize people to use Ethereum. Like it should be, it should provide a service. It should be like the the best block space, the most credibly neutral decentralized censorship resistant block space. Um, and, you know, they're, I think the crypto ecosystem is like big enough to to have other block space that's for sale. And um, yeah, I guess I'm not too worried about everyone being like maximally Ethereum aligned, you know, insofar as it doesn't become like an us versus them. I feel like there's way too much like PVP knowledge and or PVP like mindset and like eating a larger portion of my pie rather than like growing the pie for everyone. I don't know. It it just feels like if crypto is as important as we think it could be, then like fighting over the scraps of what exists right now in terms of like market share and like users and and apps and stuff just isn't like that productive. And and just building for like a better version of the crypto future is is probably like doesn't have to be Ethereum aligned to to be the only way to do it. You know what I mean? Were you annoyed by the alignment anons? I thought they were funny. I mean, you inspired a lot of them, right? Like it was all your t- <laughs> your tweets about like Maybe Justin initially. and Italy, like burning, burning, yeah. like burning, burning the hundred dollar bill in front of the homeless guy instead of giving it to him. That was, <laughs> yeah. But I think it, for the most part now, like the, it just doesn't feel that relevant to the discourse. No, you know, I, I agree. The only thing matters is if you post your data the ethereum l1 like you can't post it to celestia that's the only like alignment thing at this point you just if you post it to celestia it's like very very unaligned apart from that i think you're good to go yeah we should probably cut it here right <laughs> all right 
Yeah, uh, I really appreciate it. It was super fun. Thanks for coming along. We're gonna have you guys back too, uh, for sure. I say we. I will have you back on the podcast for sure. <laughs>